welcome to another edition of Turned at a Punk. I'm your host, Damien Abraham, and once again, I'm bringing you a conversation with someone who grew up listening to punk, may or may not still be involved with punk, but had their life changed by the genre in a major way. And today on the show, not one, but two incredible guests, one making his return to the show, the great Jason Udarcy, who of course plays with Bob Mould, Super Chunk, Sunday Real Estate, he played in Verboten, plays his own solo records as well, has his own solo records as well, like a, a one of the greatest guys in music. And coming to the show for the first time, director and actor, Michael Shannon. And you might know Michael Shannon from Boardwalk Empire. You might know him from Amsterdam. You might know him from Superman. You might know him from a lot of different projects. Uh, George and Tammy, an incredible show as well. We'll talk about all this in one second. But they are here together because they are collaborating on a tribute to the Murmur record, and they will be taking that show on the road. More on that in one second. But first, if you want to get in touch with me, head over to the email address, turnedoutapunkpodcast at gmail.com. That is run by my brother and show producer and guest booker extraordinaire, Tristan Abraham. Thank you, Tristan, for all the hard work you do. And he will get the message to me. You can find me on X or Instagram at Damien. Probably going to start a thread soon. Uh, if you want to find the show on any social media platforms, you can find Turned Out a Punk at Turned Out a Punk on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and uh, TikTok. So head on over to those platforms and follow and check out some of the stuff that gets posted on there. All right, that is it. I play in a band. We are called Fucked Up. You can find out more information over at fuckedup.cc. If you're listening to this when it first comes out, we are on our way back to Canada after a European tour. So hopefully I got to see some of you out there. If not, maybe next time. Head over, though, to fuckedup.cc. I'm sure there'll be merch, new records, all sorts of fun stuff over there. And upcoming tour announcements as well, if we're going back on the road or anything like that. That'll be posted on there first. And that is it on to today's show. As I said off the top, coming to the show today, returning to the show, Jason New Darcy, who's one of my favorite people to see, uh, just such a positive spirit. Check out his first episode on the show. It is a fantastic listen. And a guy who Dave Grohl uh, credits with inspiring him to play music. And so Jason has a pretty key role in the history of rock and roll through influence and in his own right as well. So check out that first episode with Jason. And Jason uh, has brought along with him for this return his buddy, Michael Shannon. Michael Shannon, of course, is a very well-known Oscar-nominated actor, won tons of other awards for different projects, a uh, yeah, phenomenal actor. If you've not watched George and Tammy, it's George and Tammy, not Tammy and George, right? George and Tammy, yeah. A great miniseries looking at uh, George Jones and Tammy Wynette's decade long relationship with each other. Uh, he sings in it too. He's got an unbelievable voice and it's, it's great. We talk about it on the show and, and we get into the sort of the punk connection on that as well, but he is now with Jason taking this tribute to REM's murmur record on the road and they will be performing Mur murmur cover to cover. They've done this before with the modern lovers record and some other records where uh, they, they take it incredibly seriously as you'll hear in this show. Uh, when they talk about it. And it's also something that, uh, yeah, they, they, a way of them celebrating uh, the music that they love. As I said off the top, they will be taking this on the road in February. So you can head over to, over on Jason Narducci's uh, Instagram page. I think he's got some links there. Uh, but the dates are as follows. February 1st and 2nd in San Francisco. February 4th in Minneapolis. The 8th in Athens, Georgia the 9th in Carborough, North Carolina, the 10th in Washington, D.C., the 12th in Admore, PA, the 13th in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and wrapping it all up in Brooklyn, New York on February 14th. So uh, go on out to those shows and check out these guys perform Murmur. I wish I could see that. I wish it was coming to Toronto. really do. Anyway, I'm not going to ramble on anymore. Sit back, relax, and enjoy Jason Narducci and Michael Shannon on Turned Out a Punk. Jason, Michael, thank you for coming on the show. Our pleasure. Great to be here, Damien. Good to see you. Well, Jason, as you have been here before, you know the drill, and I'm very happy to have you back because I will say, Michael, you have picked a hell of a, uh, 
a co-pilot on this musical journey you guys are on because Jason is one of the most beloved people, as you know, in all of music. Oh, don't I know it. I mean, uh, I just saw him recently uh, open up for Bob Mould here at, uh, at, well, at the White Eagle in Jersey City. And uh, yeah, he's a very charismatic uh, young man. There's no doubt about that. And he can play lights out. Well, I and I've I've cheated and I've listened to you guys uh, on that talk house interview, and uh, so I I have come and prepared. But Jason, you kind of buried the lead when you were talking about Verboten as your first musical endeavor, because you and I both know this is where it starts, right, with the cleaning ladies. <laughs> well, I did do one video and single with the cleaning ladies before Verboten. That's true. Do you know about this, Michael? No, Jason. <laughs> Jason started even younger than Verboten. Jason started. How is, it, how is it possible? Well, I, I, at the risk of forcing you to tell the story again, Jason, maybe you should take over and explain this thing. Because to me, this band, the Cleaning Ladies, are one of the most underrated Chicago power pop bands. And Stay Away From My Girl is one of the most underrated. Is it Stay Away From My Girl? I'm, I'm not butchering the name. Uh, uh, give Up On My Girl. Give Up On My Girl is one of the, yeah. it's an all-time power pop classic. But Jason, please indulge michael and myself uh my dad taught uh, film at northwestern university and he had some students who were in a band called the cleaning ladies and i think there was some like social event some sort of like party or something where my dad took me along i was probably nine or ten years old and the cleaning ladies had uh, john anderson the singer had a the guitar laying around and I picked it up and just started playing and he saw that and he's like, I'm going to write a song for us. So he wrote a song called give up on my girl where we're, we're fighting over the same lady and um, not cleaning lady, but lady. And <laughs> they made a They made a video of it in, in which we, we physically brawl at the end. And you do a fantastic job acting in that video too. Well, thank you. You are, you are. Hey, amazing. stay in your lane. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, there's, there's also that fact that you both, well, both being actors, musicians, but also both having professor parents. I found interesting too. Hmm. Oh yeah. Yes. Well, yeah. My dad was a professor at DePaul university. So he was, he was down in the city. You know. Well, at the risk of about, making it about myself uh depaul university is where i played many of my first chicago shows in a classroom oh really really yeah my uh how did that come about my friend mark hurst was a student there and uh he just as punks do found a way and went in there one day and was like i think we should have shows here and was this fucked up or what band with fucked it? up yeah with fucked wow. up my other band pink eye also played one of our few shows there as well <laughs> i think fucked up played there twice wow pink eye once wow it was awesome i saw bands from holland there i saw bands from japan there it was it, it, it was in a, a classroom wild, in a classroom with the, with the you guys like, set up a little pa uh, they brought in a PA. I don't know. I think you probably would rent the PA from outside and stuff. Yeah. But that's the thing that's amazing about this this music. And I, we'll, we'll talk about this later on. But, you know, how this this music's one part of this thing that happens with punk. But the other part of it is a sort of like anyone can do this thing. And it's, it's mm -hmm. DIY or die. And you'll find a way to make this culture happen. And you just gave people permission to do anything from from theater to comedy to film, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, that was definitely the spirit of a lot of the theater I did early on in Chicago. Do it anywhere, anytime. Yeah, I mean, there was a place called Cafe Voltaire on Clark Street. Street. Yeah. Like a vegan cafe. And you could go down in the basement and do plays. Um, you didn't really even have to have any money. They split the door with you. And I did all kinds of crazy stuff down there yeah it's awesome how it's like freeing it is to kind of be able to uh to fail at at making art and be a young person and be making art that older people consider valid and that can succeed with older people and you can wind up creating something that like hits with people that you look up to and you're you're like a kid and there's very few places that allow you that like punk and i guess theater and on like sort of a real sort of like diy level comedy too I think is another place. 
pro wrestling yeah. maybe wrestling <laughs> jesus mike I, mike I'm, mike when you did those cafe voltaire things was that through a company or was it just you and friends collaborating well uh so i'm part of a company called red orchid in chicago which is over 30 years old but before red orchid i had started a tiny theater company called the walking company which was basically named after the fact that i like to walk so much now the new brand i think called the walking company and i've thought about suing them but i <laughs> didn't copyright the name so um but we would do things crazy things like there's this play called the zoo story which is just two fellas uh, basically talking on a park bench and uh my friend at the time, Dan, he was the guy I started the company with. And I said, hey, Dan, wouldn't it be crazy if we did the zoo story without rehearsing? So that when you came to see it, if you were at the first show, you were literally seeing the first time that we ever did it. Wow. So we, yeah, we learned our lines separately. And, and then that first performance, uh, the, the only thing we had to figure out before the play started was at the end of the play, one of the characters uh, gets stabbed. So uh, right before the audience came in, me and Dan were trying to figure out how to do this stabbing <laughs> in, in a way where, not. <laughs> and then we looked at each other and said, you ready for this? And said, yep. And then the people came in and it actually turned out to be uh, in, in that, you know, milieu uh, kind of a, a hit. But, uh, you know, I use the word hit uh, sparingly, you know, because you could only get so many people in the basement there. But we did it for a while. Yeah, I, I think that's the other thing that's amazing about both theater and, and certainly punk is that the metrics for success are whatever you make them. So it's like you sell it a basement. That's a hit, right? Like you <laughs> and then and then you can always have. Well, if I do find I don't want success because that would be selling out as your insulation from any chance of failure you're like well i just never wanted success anyway <laughs> that's right insulation's a good word yes <laughs> it's also like the, the the higher the the barometer is for success or whatnot the more constrictions there tend to be on your artistic freedom you know so um it was that kind of sweet spot where you could really do whatever the heck you wanted and um you didn't have somebody looking over your shoulder saying, well, I don't know if that's such a good idea. It's fascinating because punk, well, certainly on this podcast, having people on, so many kids came out of theater that wind up doing punk music. Mm. Um, but going back, like the, the movement itself kind of comes out of theater, like Theater of the Ridiculous and Jane County and Patti Smith. They were all performing in Jackie Curtis plays or, you know, um, you know the... the uh, uh, Vienna actionist kind of stuff that was inspiring Malcolm McLaren and, and the Sex Pistols and sort of it's it is really out of theater as much as it's born out of rock and roll. It's kind of the two meeting, you know, like street rock and roll and high flute and art aspirations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I think well, and that's the thing is like if if you if you go by the basic premise that in order to play punk music you don't have to perhaps be the world's most gifted musician um but you do have to be compelling you know which is a performative thing which is a a theatrical thing so it, it makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. it's interesting because i also uh cheated and i heard you on uh, i think it was mark maron's podcast michael and you talked about how in acting there's like the the attempt to disappear as a person yes uh, but that's like it's almost like the antithesis of what being a, you know, when I say punk also, I include REM, I include modern lovers. I include like, so it's a broad tent, but like the opposite of what punk is and, and kind of the opposite of what this type of theater that we're talking about is too, where like you have to kind of be there from what you're describing, performing a stage, a, a play for the first time, like you found your character, but like you also have to be there in a way that you probably don't disappear well yeah i mean uh 
ideally you find some it's like a venn diagram you know there's some overlap between you and and the per person you're presenting i mean you only can draw in your own life as a resource as a frame of reference you know but uh i've always thought it was interesting too because a lot of uh, the punk uh, personalities over the years that's not really who they are you know they they go out and present like oh my god that guy's scary or this person's crazy or whatever and then you you see them at the diner or whatever and they're just eating a hamburger like anybody else you know it's, it's so um or you see them at flash dance or you hey leaving hey. Leaving. Oh, okay. All right. I thought I got confused. You didn't mean flash dancers. You meant flash dancers. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Yeah, like uh, you know, but we all know that David Yao's also David Yao. You know, like it's not like that's just a character right. on stage. Like that's where he's he's letting it out. But there's him well, you know, he really wants that. He's really wants. He's really interested in acting. Yeah, he's been in some good stuff. Yeah, over the we've years. been tr trying to find something to do together. Uh, it hasn't panned out yet, but uh, yeah, he's um, he he he. I think if if he had his brothers, he might kind of move away from the 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 music and uh, more towards the acting. I think. The type of performance he does is just so uh, visceral. Like you can't keep that up forever. You, just to like no. have to go out there. Well, and he hurts himself so much. Absolutely, yeah. Like I've seen him cut himself. I've seen. I saw someone in the audience slash him with a knife one time because there's also. That's, that's not nice. No, it was terrible. Why, why did Why they do that? Yeah, no reason. I was at Texas at a South by Southwest and he was in the crowd and in someone's face and she reached out and slashed him with, a, I think it was a razor. Oh. I don't, I'm not, I might be missing. Oh, he wasn't even performing. He was performing. He oh, was he like, was. you know, he was doing the David Yao in your yeah. face kind of part of the Not that it's not that that's okay, but yeah. Okay. No, but I think there's like also people come to these shows after a while, I guess with an expectation of, yeah. of violence or of him hurting himself. I mean, you're one to talk about that, Damien. Well, I try and get away from it now. Like that's my whole life. Is <laughs> <laughs> Mike, the first time I saw Damien was at, uh, and this sounds so funny to say now, but Coachella used to actually have uh, some pretty progressive programming. Curated. Oh, yeah. But in 2009, um, I had never seen Fucked Up, but Bob Mould told me about them. And um, and I think that was Bob's first show of you guys was. too, wasn't it? It yeah. was, yeah. So my wife and I, um, she came out because it was our, our anniversary and um and and no one knew that she was pregnant with eva except for us she was maybe two months pregnant three months pregnant and um we got it we got in the crowd to watch you guys and just the energy did i ever tell you this david <laughs> the energy the energy i just looked at her i was like let's take five steps back <laughs> and then we did and sure enough, you guys walked on stage. You took your head to the, the drum kit, blood all over, and you're in the crowd. And it was like, this is a great band, but I'm glad we took five steps back. <laughs> oh well, wow! Here, here's where the I wish I would have seen that. Uh, well, I, I can send you some photos. There's a uh, a hip hop website that covered it at the time that said white people do the dumbest shit. <laughs> 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 Had a lot of photos of the set. <laughs> It's true. It's true. <laughs> yeah, well, I, true. I but, saw probably the greatest performance, a live music performance I've ever seen at Coachella. Uh, it was, and it immediately followed one of the worst live performances I'd ever seen. <laughs> wow, this is already juicy and good. Let's hear it. Well, the year I went, the big, the big deal uh, was going to be the White Stripes. It was mm -hmm. kind of at the apex of their. Uh, their thing you know and they were on the main stage the whites they uh walked out and they it, they just seemed a little overwhelmed i mean there were i don't know 50 60 000 people standing out there staring at them and uh jack white just kind of complained about the sound the whole show 
and I'm sure the sound was awful because how can you have great sound with a little two piece playing for that many people? But nevertheless, uh, it, it was unfortunate because I, I was a fan and I was looking forward to seeing them and, and it was just kind of a bummer. And then they walked off and, um, I was like, well, let's go get some food. I was there with my friend Zorn because we were all just kind of, um, I don't know, disappointed. And then people were milling around and not really looking at the stage. And all of a sudden, I'm not looking at the stage. I'm trying to figure out whether I want a hot dog or a beef sandwich or whatever. And all of a sudden, behind me, I hear, hey, motherfuckers. And everybody, every head in that audience, it was like whiplash. It was like, whoa, <laughs> who, what, what's happening? And Iggy Pop walked out on stage and he had just put the Stooges back together. It, of course, uh, the bass player had passed, so he had Mike Watt on bass and proceeded to just completely decimate the place. I mean... It was like a religious experience. I mean, I'd never seen that much energy come out of one human being. It was, um, I think about it all the time. Wow. And um, and the Red Hot Chili Peppers had to go on after him, and they waited an hour before they went on stage. Because <laughs> yeah. they were like, this isn't fair. <laughs> this is ridiculous why are you making us do this because this man just gave the greatest rock performance of all time of yeah. all time i saw them did you ever give with them jason did you ever do a show with those guys the stooges yeah yeah the greatest like it's, it's crazy how oh i mean and mike i hear you because it's like you know he's not a large man he's a little man and but the power i mean to use the word that's obvious, but the power that comes off of him. And I, one thing that I noticed, and this was this was Riot Fest in Denver, and like replacements were on the bill too. Um, I was there with Super Chunk. It was probably like 2014 or something like that, maybe 10 years ago. 18 year olds singing along to the Stooges. They knew every word. It was it, that music just transcends all the all of those things, and then the way he performs it is. Uh, and I could see he also has this little tent off the side. <laughs> I don't know if that's like oxygen or what, but like he will sometimes go off there while Watt is like humping the amps or something. And then he comes <laughs> back out and just supercharges and pretty phenomenal. But sometimes so he, they have to carry him off the stage. Like it's yeah. the second he crosses, the second he yeah. knows nobody can see him anymore, he collapses. Yeah, 100%. And someone has to drag him around. Yeah, that's exactly like we we played with them one time. It was the day after they had all their gear stolen in Montreal. Oh shit! Um, and we got asked to do the bill, jump on the bill, kind of last minute at Massey Hall, like where you know the Neil Young Live Records Forum. I saw Cats there. I saw Noam Chomsky mm -hmm. do a lecture there one time. Um, and uh, we're like, okay, well, you know, we're not going to top the Stooges in any songs because they're you know like you're saying they're the greatest of all time. But like I've got energy. And so I said, we'll go out there and we'll just blow people's minds with our energy. And I had a cordless mic. I was running around. They came out on stage with borrowed gear and just wiped the floor. <laughs> See, this reminds me because I worked with Henry Rollins once. We did this really silly movie. Um, and he was we were shooting in a swamp one night and we, it was one of these terrible situations where you're just up all night sitting in the mud in a swamp oh, and uh, uh, trying to shoot this opening sequence to the bad boys two movie. But uh, we, we struck up a conversation and he was really cool. And I told him about seeing Iggy and he said, he said, I was on a tour. It was Rollins band the Cure, and Iggy. What? And and I was the opener. Rollins was the opener, and The Cure was the headliner, and Iggy was the middle band. And they were touring in Europe, and the first night of the tour, Rollins was so freaking nervous because Iggy was his hero. 
and and he he had to go on first and and they all had to play on the cure set which had all these he said they had all these like giant potted plants all over the stage or something they had some you know curish type set and um so rollins is just you know getting all worked up before he goes out on stage and he's walking out on the stage and iggy's standing there in the wings and he watches his set and ron said he's like i gave everything i gave the best i've never done it harder than i than that and then he walks off and Iggy's standing there and he looks at him and he says, yeah, that was, that was pretty good. <laughs> and Rollins like, Oh gee, Iggy, thank you. And then Rollins stands there and he watches Iggy go out and Iggy does his set. And by the time Iggy set is over, all of the potted plants have been <laughs> destroyed. The stage is covered in like mud and plants and Iggy walks off with like mud and blood all over him. And he goes up to Henry and he says, You can try as hard as you want, man, but you're never gonna you're never gonna beat me. Oh my no. god. hundred percent. All you do is charge him up. <laughs> yeah. You know? He's absorbing your power and he's gonna yeah. throw it back in your face. It was yeah. like a Detroit street fight. It's crazy. He is and like he was doing like <clears throat> head first stage dives into the seats it's a seated venue and he's oh, flying God. off and like no that's why he collapsed like you're saying he does he literally collapses right as soon as he gets backstage and has to be carried carried off but yeah it's interesting though like you said with the white stripes like how a change in a venue though like the white stripes are one of the most powerful live bands in a small space but yeah how do you translate that to a bigger space you know like certain venues where you have to scale it up you just can't do it in the same way and you know i think that's what you see with jack white solo stuff it's it's a lot bigger in this presentation yeah like i was watching um i don't know what's the rack and tours or something at the austin city limit show and they that, they put on a hell of a show but i think it was also something about and i don't mean to disparage her but like meg white's drumming is a little can be a little lethargic sometimes and i don't think it suited that uh i don't know it just it it, it was too diffused i think by the space well i think anything like that kind of drumming because she's right she is like her type of drumming and there's like mo tucker and there's like a there's a tradition of this kind of drumming but it is it's such a sparse type of drumming that you you can't fill you know when we went on coachella like and here's where I'm going to let you guys behind the scenes. I didn't actually hit my head on the drums. I pulled out a razor blade and had taken a bunch of aspirin and nicked my forehead as I wasn't going to say anything. Dude. I'm sorry. I had to let Michael in on the, uh, <laughs> which is a, a pro wrestling. It's a pro wrestling thing that the wrestlers do. And, uh, and that's what gave me those sheets of blood and didn't give me a concussion too, but Coachella did make well, us buy the I, microphone. You're, you're really, yeah, but they, the guy's like, you got to buy this microphone. I'm like, why? And he turns it upside down and blood starts pouring out of the microphone. <laughs> oh, dear. I, I was already won over by the music, but when you went into the crowd pouring blood out and the song ended and you said, hey, guys, I just want to let you know that I've been tested. That's when I was like, I'm all in with this band. Well, I feel I feel like it was for what? <laughs> I, I, I would get myself tested for STIs because I felt like if I'm going to be bleeding on – people which i would not do now as a parent of three there's no way I, I really regret all this stuff and i really wish there was no such thing as google because uh. <laughs> well on a practical note though is is it i hear you don't get a sound check at coachella no i don't think we did no i think it's just like a line check um yeah. which I'm fine with, but yeah, I imagine if you're like trying to find the sound, but like you're saying, like, there's just, you, you can't translate it. Like that play that you did in the basement. Do you think that would have worked on Broadway? Like, could you? No, could... hell no, no way. Yeah. No, we would have been, it would have been a disaster. Yeah. Yeah. And there's like this sort of, I don't know. There's like, that's the amazing thing is there's so many people we all meet in our lives at different levels where their bands are like the best or they're the best actor at, I imagine, you know, I'm saying this is someone looking from the outside in uh, at that level, but they just can't scale it up 
to whatever the next level requires. And then eventually everyone's going to hit a ceiling with what they're doing. And the white stripes are one of those glitches in the matrix where it just got so much bigger than I think even they ever thought it would. Right. Yeah. When was the first time you heard punk, Michael? That's actually what I'm supposed to ask at the very beginning of the show. But we got Oh, it. well. Or heard the word, even the phrase for the word. I don't know if I'm going to be able to pop that off, but I will say that um, when I was uh, maybe 13, um, I became obsessed with uh, the talking heads. And... Uh, I still maintain that obsession to this day, but but it was more fevered, I guess, back then. But um, I had all the records, and um, I uh, at some point I can't do it anymore. I actually somebody tested me on it the other day, and I kind of failed. But I used to be able to rattle off all the songs on all the albums in album order. Wow. Uh, but uh yeah and i had videos and uh I, I even had this weird video they put out called storytelling giant which was a compilation of all their music videos um yeah i was just obsessed with them so that was my first and then that kind of led to uh some other music um but I remember the first time I came to New York, all I wanted to do was go to CBGB's. And then I went there and I don't know, the, <laughs> the magic was gone. But but I, I didn't care because I was still in, in the room, you know. And the people that were playing, were they were fine. They weren't terrible, but it just wasn't. But I just sat there and thought about all the bands that had been there, you know. Oh, it's crazy. Like we, yeah. I think it also depends, obviously, the night you go. Like I, I lucked out. The one time I got to play there was one of my favorite shows we ever played. Did you play there, Jason? You must never have. did. You never no. played there. Oh man. No. Oh man. It was yeah. Like it was when it was good. It was incredible. The crow's nest, people diving off the crow's nest, and people like sitting on top of the stage. Like it really does. And but it's. I guess it's like anything else. It's like the magic actually doesn't come from the room. It comes from the people. Like here's this room that everyone that went there during the early years just talks about the smell because, you know, Healy's dog was shitting on the floor and they were making chili. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so that's quite a combo. Yeah. The smell must have been intoxicating. Your own oh, man. <laughs> but if you look at the big four, the, the CBGB's big four being like Blondie, the Ramones, talking heads. talking heads, and Dead Boys, you kind of have like the the four heads of what punk is, you know, like the aspiring rock stars that are debaucherous in the Dead Boys, uh, the the pop geniuses in Blondie, the art geniuses in the Talking Heads, and the street thugs in Johnny Ramone from yeah. all accounts. Yeah, it's like a compass of yeah. punk music. <laughs> <laughs> it is it is and ever ever since then it's like where do you place yourself within these uh four polarities of this thing yeah well i was always i mean i was I, yeah i was always i would say in kind of the artsy uh arty uh quadrant myself although <clears throat> I, I i like to thrash around and all that um but I don't know. I just thought, uh, I mean, talking heads, uh, I mean, this word gets thrown around a lot, but I, I feel like they're pretty unique. I, I don't think there's any other band that really, I know they have a lot of influences and, and they even own up to them very openly, but, uh, it's just, and each one of those records is so different from the other, you know, it's yeah. like, I mean, when Fear of Music came along, I was like, oh, where the hell did this come from? You know, this isn't like more songs about buildings and food. And then Remain in Light comes out and you're like, gee whiz, these guys can do anything. Yeah. Mike, did we ever talk about the the Adrian Balud days? Oh, no. 
Well, he was he went on tour with them a lot. I know because he was on yeah. that that great concert record. The name of this band is Talking Heads. Yeah, I had no I, I had no idea, and I'm sure Damien, you've had Brendan Canty on on the show, but no, not yet. Oh, you haven't? No, oh. I've, I've I'm like really lacking in Fugazi and Minor Threat members on this uh, on this podcast. Brendan. Brendan's awesome. awesome. I feel like though I, I feel like they're almost like Jesus like figures. Like I'm doing a podcast for <laughs> Christianity and, and they're the Christ. So to have them on might might blow up the whole formula. Brendan, I, I was this was like a year ago. I was at Brendan's house and he he was talking about the Talking Heads and he's like he brought up Adrian Ballou and I I don't know how I missed that, but he I think it's that concert you're talking about, Mike. It's actually on YouTube and I think it's at Madison Square Garden. They were mm. so much bigger than I realized. And there's Adrian mm. Ballou not only playing guitar, but singing like a, a prominent role in the band. I just had no idea. Such yeah. an interesting little, you know, corner of their history. <clears throat> I also feel like Jerry Harrison's like such an underrated person in the history of music. Like just his contribution, obviously, to Modern Lovers and and, and them too. Just like a, And as a producer. And as a producer too. Just yeah. like like that's the when you listen and i wish i got to see you guys cover that record because that's like i think the greatest record of all time but uh-huh. that, it but like when you listen to it with headphones and you hear these organs on like hospital and stuff you're like oh mm-hmm. this is what's this is what's driving this thing in a in a real way oh yeah hospital is just i uh, just words fail me yeah it's one of the yeah, that's a really uh, surprisingly I found that album very difficult to sing. It's very hard to sing like Jonathan Richmond um, cuz he's like it sounds like he's not putting much into it, but he's actually very a very skillful singer. It's hard to sound I don't it's it's it sounds at first glance like you know irony or sarcasm but it, it's also very <laughs> earnest at the same so time right. it's, totally. yeah, like, it's a real head fuck it's like are, do you mean this or not i can't <laughs> tell you know? it was really weird well you did it mike mike uh, you did a fantastic job that night i thought that was a that was one of my favorite shows that we've done oh um, yeah well i love and it. i yeah when you picked that record i was like Oh man, Jonathan Richmond, he's a tough one. Um, but the fact that that record came out in 1976, and I think it was recorded in 74. I mean, mm. yes, way, 70, way ahead. I think. I think it's 73. Really? Yeah, because I think um, it's like two sessions. It's crazy. It's crazy. I mean, Why? Put, I would put She Cracked up against any punk rock song. I think that it's like way ahead of its, of yeah. its time. Well, there's the early there's an early version of it I used to have, or some of the songs on it anyway that that Kim Fowley had produced. Mm-hmm. Oh, really? And it sounds a little different, but this was early. This is like, I think the delay in getting it out was, I don't know. I think Kim tried to insert himself into it, and then they were like, "No, this doesn't," because it didn't sound as good. The Kim Fowley version as what eventually came out. Was it lacking the the urgency? I don't know. It sounded. It just sounded kind of goofy. It didn't have hmm. the kind of ominous undertone to it. Um, it was just more. I was flatter or something. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I don't think it has the organ, right? Like I don't think Terry Harrison plays on the Kim Fowley stuff. I remember. I think Rhino did like a CD with both versions. On oh, yeah. Some form. Um, but I think that might be the difference. If I'm, I don't know. I might mis- be misremembering that because I Jerry remember- Harrison. He's the difference. I mean, yeah. how cool is that to be in those two bands? I mean, <laughs> yeah, who gets totally. to do that? Yeah. yeah, it's like being in the Beatles and Rolling Stones. <laughs> well, and I will go one further than you, Jason, on She Cracked going up against any punk song. I think this predicts all of punk. It, you know, I'm Straight is the first straight edge song ever. You know, right. I would say Hospital predicts emo in a way that all yeah. emo bands could only hope to get as yeah. like you're saying, like, like that emotion, like that you bleed on that track, the pop punk on there. Government there's, center is total pop punk. Go- government. Yeah. There's art punk. Yeah. There's like, it's really like a, it's such an incredible record and very much like Milo goes to college where the A side is a completely different story than the B side. Mm-hmm. And that's why I thought when you guys did it, I'm like, that's what it would take is someone like how mike when you approached it did you were you like i'm gonna do this 
as me or are you like i'm going to do this as a role where i'm being the lead singer of the modern lover still being yourself obviously in that role but like were you trying to be jonathan richmond well i listened to the songs a lot and i listened to him sing them a lot and I wouldn't say I'm like trying to mimic him, but I'm definitely trying. I, you know, I want it to be the record, you know, because that's what people are excited to hear. It's like, but with the knowledge that um, I'm not going to sound exactly like Jonathan Richmond. The I'm, spirit was that for sure. Popular. Yeah. But uh, the same thing with Murmur, you know. I mean, I can't sing like Michael Stipe, but but I I study the music. I I mean, I listen to these songs 100, 150 times before I sing them. Um, I mean, I lose track, honestly, how much I listen to them. But it's like a devotion, you know? It's like um, there's something kind of monastic about it. It's like I just decide that, I'm going to devote myself to a particular record for a particular amount of time. And I listen to it every day and I memorize <clears throat> all the lyrics. When we played with John Merster, right, for the Murmur show, he was like, wait a minute, you don't have any lyrics sheets? And I'm like, no. And he was like, I think that was the thing he was most impressed by. But I guess I'm an actor, so I'm used to like memorizing things. But yeah, but not all actors can do that many songs like that. Not even Michael well. Remember Stipe when we did that. Highway 61 Revisited? Yeah, I memorized yeah. Desolation Row, and that's at the <laughs> end of uh, that record. There's more verses in that song than the 26 <laughs> REM songs we did. <laughs> yeah. Well, that that's like when you guys invite when Bob's like, "Hey, do you want to come down and do Divide and Conquer?" With us tonight, yeah. which Oscar do for me, Michael is like that's like my that's my Elvis, you know, like that's like my North Star. So yeah. like you know, I'm like, yeah, definitely listen to this song a thousand times. To memorize it was insane. I had cheat notes all up my arm, which I oh, didn't boy. want to meeting. Bob cut the song short. He's like, no, I couldn't. I didn't want to play the whole thing. Don't worry. Uh, but, which where was that? Was that Austin? Where did we do? No, that, that was in at the Horseshoe. Oh right, God, that was fun and hot. Oh, Remember how hot amazing. that was? And it yeah. drew, I drew so much ire from the <laughs> older punks in Toronto on Facebook <laughs> because they were so jealous that I got invited to do that. It was amazing. I felt uh, very, uh, you know, very honored to have that happen. But are you earned it? Well, I don't, I don't know. I feel like, I feel, I feel very fortunate that that's why we're talking about having metrics and goals. And setting your goals like this is all i wanted to achieve like this is beyond my wildest dreams what i've gotten to do so far so yeah like play with the stooges i got to sing with bob mold you know like i, I really i'm a, I, all i want to do is be a punk singer so yeah did you want to be on screen or did you want to just be would you be just content being on stage and the screen thing just kind of wound up happening well yeah, I uh, I love doing theater the best, the most. Um, the um, the screen thing came around uh, partially as a financial consideration because you don't make any money doing theater unless you're a big Broadway star or something. Uh, but in Chicago, when I was doing plays, if a TV show or a movie came around, um, you could make some money. Uh, if you were lucky enough to get on one of those. And then I was doing a play here in New York City, actually, and I met this fellow who said he wanted to be my manager, and he seemed like he knew what he was talking about, so I, I, I went with him, and he said, now you got to go to L.A. You got to go to L.A., and I'm going to... I'm like, I don't want to go to L.A. He's like, are you crazy? Why not? I said, I know so many of my friends have gone out to L.A. and it just sounds really sad. And they all work at like pizza places. They deliver pizzas and I don't want to do that. He's like, well, I don't think that's going to happen. I said, OK. So I went out there 
and I got real lucky and I got a, a bunch of cool gigs and made some cash. And then after a couple of years, I was like, okay, I'm going back to Chicago. And I went back to Chicago to do a play. And <clears throat> I've figured out now a way to kind of have my cake and eat it too, which is pretty, pretty lucky. But um, yeah, I'm doing a play right now. Uh, about to our first show is Saturday night actually so but I've over the years I've I've, I've certainly grown to appreciate uh, movies uh, doing movies and and even a little bit of the TV work I've done but uh, but I always want to get back on stage basically yeah it feels like I don't know like I don't know I feel about you jason but i definitely feel very comfortable going back to playing with no stage on the floor of a community space i could play that depaul classroom tomorrow and i'm probably way more comfortably than i could ever at any level that we've kind of faked getting to like opening for the food fighters or anything like that i like both <laughs> <laughs> oh remember I when we played that that uh, the vfw uh in evanston yeah that was kind of like that vibe, right? And we that, and we played a Stooges song. Yeah, yeah, we did. That was fun. What song my, did you guys do? My, my band split single was playing. Um, there's this venue in Evanston called Space. It's a it's a fantastic venue, but they do these outdoor festival series called Out of Space. And Jeff Tweedy was doing a solo headlining thing outside, and they they put they asked split single if we wanted to play in this 200 capacity. V it really was like a VFW. It's like walking straight into 1978 when you walk in. Deer hunter PA, vibes. P PA on a stick. Yeah, the stage is four inches off the ground. And we split single opened with seven new songs, which felt great. And then Mike was in town, and I asked him if he wanted to come come sing a song. And um, I want to be your dog. And then the, there was another song that was almost the exact same title. I want to be, I want adored. To be adored. Yeah, I was like, uh. I want to sing, I want to be your dog, and I want to be adored. Yeah. I want to be songs. What, yeah. what, oh, do you go from I want to be your dog into I want to be adored? Because it seems like hard to come back from I want to be your dog energy level wise. I think dog was last. Okay. Yeah, I think, well yeah. played. Yeah. Well played. Yeah. Do, you, do you find, because Jason, like when you were on last time, you gave like a, the most insight to me I've ever had about, you know, being a sideman and, you know, versus being a solo, doing your solo thing or doing mm -hmm. your own band where you were like, you have to be a good hang. And also like, and I, but since then I've talked to like Robert Trujillo and I've talked to like um, Chris Shiflett, like people that have mm -hmm. joined bands that were already in there and having to adapt to it. And there is kind of like this sort of, I don't know. Well, you tell me, is there like a role playing aspect to it? Like when you're on stage trying to play, to this band's style or who this band is, but is there also like kind of like until you kind of get your bearings, you you have to kind of play completely neutral in a way that you can in your own band, or at least I could never it, do. It is a little bit of role playing in that um, I find myself <clears throat> getting physically prepared for tours, you know, like sounds stupid, but like core work or stationary bike stuff, just because of the physical demand, certainly the Bob Mold band where there's only three people in the band. And so the power has to come from all of us pretty evenly. Um, and super chunk is a physical thing too. You know, I, since I did the podcast last time, I've been jumping in with sunny day real estate. Mike came to a, a Brooklyn show that we did and that's yeah. much less physical, but more articulation. There's a lot of, single note pl i'm playing guitar which is another different thing instead of playing bass and backing harmonies and just sort of like a level of precision and um detail work that's unique to you know like super chunk and bob mole it's more about power than it is about precision but um in, in all those situations i am trying to <clears throat> be supportive and be positive energy um and i think that's just from years and years of touring with people and recognizing that Sometimes when people are caught up in their own thing or they just uh, – any kind of negative energy can really bring the whole thing down, you know? Like for me, maybe I'm just sensitive to it, but that's my that's my try. I'm, I don't know if I'm 
uh, perfect at it, but that's, that's the energy that I'm trying to bring is just supportive and positive and kind of checking in with people and then also backing off and being quiet. I mean, sunny day real estate, I forget what show you came to Mike, but we did two Brooklyn steals. And at one of them, they were really struggling with, uh, what the set list should be. It must've been the second show, um, to how to differentiate it from the first one. And it took a while. And I just, you know, inside my brain, I'm like, well, I have some ideas about this, but then I was like, it's not my role here. I'm just going to sit back and let that, let these guys who have been together for 30 years work through. And it wasn't like an argument or anything, but they were in deep discussion about what to play. And I had to just kind of watch, you know, and just let it play out the way it was going to play out. But I don't, I don't know if I have any, you know, like, uh, I just I try to fit, fit that role when I'm when I'm playing with in other people's bands. Also, on like stage level performance wise, like you can't do what you do. You can't be Jason from the Bob Mold trio in Sunny Day, right? Like you can't, you know, like people would not that energy would not go over. Totally, yeah. It's like, what is that one guy doing? <laughs> <It's> <laughs> well, <going on. laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, <laughs> taking cues from from the other band members. Dan in that band is, is is probably the most physical as far as movement. And then William with his drum playing, it's very physical, but it's it's not lateral. It's just kind of centered energy. And um, But they have their own power, you know? There's a lot of power in that. There's slower tempo songs and, and uh, emotive, obviously. All all out of hardcore too. Every single band you play in. Oh, they're huge. They're massive Fugazi fans. They're massive oh. Fugazi fans. Deeper than that, we're talking about uh, members of uh, Resolution and uh, Galleon's Lap, and there's like deep DIY hardcore vibes to them, like straight edge hardcore vibes too. I think Jeremy had like some crazy hardcore band back in the day too. He did, but they were also showing me video of the three of them playing when he was like 16. Yeah. They've known each other a long time. Yeah. That, <clears throat> yeah. I've, I think that Seattle stuff that gets kind of overshadowed by the Nirvana thing is so fascinating. Like all these other bands that were kind of happening and I don't know, it's, it's such a, a vital period for, for yeah. music. Though. Incredible music city. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting. Like when you look at like punk starting and John Lydon said that his main influence as a performer was uh, Richard the <laughs> third Olivier's performance. Like it wasn't actually a musician. What he was, yeah. to, it was this sort of, you know, but it is does it does have that kind of like performative element the whole way through, mm -hmm. as, as much as it's meant to be real. Well, yeah, that's what I was talking about earlier. You know, it's like that cat's not Johnny Rotten all the time, but when he goes up, he puts on that persona, and he's he's probably basing that persona, yeah, on all. It does not surprise me that I, I didn't know that, but it doesn't surprise me to hear that. At I think all. he says. I think he says in that Julian Temple documentary that they did uh filth of fury where he's talking about it but it makes sense because he's not you know much like iggy pop like i always and I've, i never asked him this actually and i really regret it but like there's no influence for iggy pop in the same way i guess there's no influence for michael stipe or or jonathan richmond like these people were coming from like a completely unique place with it like you're yeah. saying with david byrne too and not to be about. replicated as many yeah. people have tried yeah 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 yeah. Yeah. I remember because I, I, I had been, because I kind of, I, I, I had the good fortune to develop a, a, a smidge of a relationship with Mr. Stipe uh, over the years. And I debated to, whether to tell him I was doing this or not. Because I thought, part of me thought, well, maybe he'll just think I'm an idiot for trying to do something <laughs> like that or, or, you know, or get upset about it. But he was, but he was really sweet about it. And I, I kind of told him, I don't know, a day or two before the show. And he was very supportive. And he said, oh, I'm so flattered. And thank you. And da, da, da. And then I said, and then I was like, but how do you do this? And he's like, yeah, I don't know. He told me to stomp my feet on the ground uh, before I went out to get grounded. That was mm. his, uh, that was his piece of advice. And then he, he sent me a picture of him with a big smile on his face. <laughs> and I made a made it my screensaver for a couple of days. And then 
I put one of my kids back on there because that's <laughs> that's who's supposed to be there. <laughs> I, I get that vibe. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the thing that's amazing when you have kids is like no matter how great the accolade, no matter how amazing the moment is, the reality is as soon as you get home, you can have no ego because they will chop you the fuck down. <laughs> yeah. 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 I thought I was cool. I thought I was cool, but now my I got a 14 year old. I'm a yeah. fucking loser. I'm a loser. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're passing the baton. Now they're cool. Yeah. You don't get yeah. to be cool forever, I guess. <laughs> well, and if, if they're if they're financially stable, let me tell you, I'd much prefer to be financially stable than cool. Yeah, you got that right. I don't want to be a cool homeless person. <laughs> <laughs> but also you like look at these people that at one time were like the cool, you brought them up earlier, Kim Fowley. Like at one point, Kim Fowley was like the coolest person except to people that actually were around him, it seems. And now of course he's definitely not cool. You, you know, no. I think that your performance of him is probably my favorite part of that movie. Oh, thanks a lot. Well, I, you know, it was an awkward situation for me because when I agreed to do the part, I didn't really know much about him. And then, and then I spent some time with him and hung out with him. Um, there was this one day where me and Joan Jett and uh, Kristen Stewart and uh, Kim Fowley met at a Denny's in the Valley. And we sat in a booth and Kim Valley walked in with all these clippings and like photo scrapbooks and things and proceeded to go through his whole life to make sure that I understood everything. And it, it was it was a very awkward situation. And then I, you know, it came to light after kind of as I was shooting the movie, it's like, you know, this might kind of be a sanitized version of this whole scenario and then someone said have you ever seen this documentary and oh it seems like he might have been kind of shady with people and and then i was like oh dear i shouldn't have done this but by then it was kind of too late but i don't know joan jett was there when we were shooting and and she she supported it um i actually saw her I took my daughter to see uh, the New York Liberty. They were in the WNBA finals and I had no idea, but Joan Jett is like a massive New York Liberty fan and goes to all the games. So I got to introduce my daughter to Joan Jett. So that made me pretty cool. <laughs> That's awesome. For a, a moment. Yeah. I was shocked that my daughter knew who Joan Jett was, but she was, it was the first time I've actually seen Sylvie kind of speechless. Like she said, you know, I like your jacket, you know, but I could tell she was struggling to figure out what to say to Joan Jett. You talk about Jonathan Richmond level pioneers of this thing. The runaways were like, yeah, it, it wouldn't be this without them. Yeah, for sure. I would love no, I just, I just loved, I just love her so much. Um, and she's so kind and yeah, down to earth. You know, she also like, you think about her, you, you know, and, and people have come on the show and debated how much actual work the germ session was. But then what she did with the Bikini Kill record, but her being in the room for the germ stuff and in the room for the Bikini Kill record where she actually really did produce that record. It's like talking about two of the most significant records to come out of punk ever afterwards. And she's still involved in it. You know, she's still yeah. involved in bands and, and playing music and stuff. Like what an inspiration. She's touring constantly. Yeah. I just saw her like, I don't know, six weeks ago or something. She has a Hot Wheels car. I bought my wife a Hot Wheels Joan Jett truck, semi truck. <laughs> a couple years really? Ago. Yeah. That's so great. <laughs> she is, uh, she is his race. Mike, Mike, when you met with her at the, at the Denny's, was, was her manager with her? No, it was just the okay. four of us. Okay. But I, I have met um, Kenny. Yeah, I met Kenny. Yeah. Kenny was at the basketball game. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, no, it was just the four of us. Yeah, I'd love if you did like uh, I don't know, I don't mean like you're pitching, but if you did, someone did a movie about Kim Fowley and Rodney Bigenheimer and that weird 
the oh. relationship those two guys had. Oh, you revisiting man. that character as they grow old together. It's such a oh, it's, it's so there's it's so layered in horrificness and just. Well, uh, wasn't there a documentary about Bingenheimer? There is, and it does not yeah. make him look great in that. And it's it's meant to be a very flattering documentary, and does not necessarily make him look yeah. too good in in the best of no. ways. Um, but I think no. they're they're at a time where. And there's not a lot of heroes if you really start digging below the surface with a lot of these musicians. Oh, geez, that scene? Oh, God. No, I don't think so. It's and pretty that, decrepit. And that's also, like, weirdly, like, that's a lot of these kids that were sadly part of this sort of young groupie scene, because that's what it was called, you know, around this Rodney's English disco, wind up being the first punk kids. Like, these kids that kind of, like, exposed this sort of, you know, trauma wind up being the kids that populate the first punk scene. Yeah, well, unfortunately, it kind of makes sense because I think, yeah, a lot of people that gravitate towards wanting to make that music are traumatized in one way or another. 100%. That comes up on yeah. the show all the time. Um, Nicole Panter, who managed the germs, said punk is people with trauma inflicting trauma on other people. <laughs> that's right yep. sadly true one of the speaking of la punk though one of the scenes that popped me bigger like just blew my fucking mind is on george and tammy like the whole time i'm watching it with lauren i'm like there's this punk song by the maggots called let's get tammy wynette there's, yeah i'm like if they get to the episode and they're talking about the kidnapping stuff and they play that song how insane would that be joking and then it happened, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> sure did. Yeah, that, that's an amazing sequence. The amazing hey. sequence. An um, unbelievable yeah. record. Like, a, I wish I hadn't traded my copy of that seven inch away because I'll never get another one. Yeah, it's probably hard to find. Jesus. Uh, the original version of it actually came with pet maggots, and they were glow in the dark maggot toys in a little box. And I unfortunately <laughs> did not have that version because I think that one goes for thousands of dollars. Oh boy. Um, <laughs> well, I wonder, but it really did. Did it? Did it change your feeling about the song at all? Knowing how tormented that poor woman was in her life. I think punk is a lot of it's about playing with stuff you shouldn't play with, and I think that song was yeah. always like knowing what I knew. Just like looking at the cover, where it's a photo of her with a legit black eye, like that's not makeup, and it's right, and it's like fuck. She went through right. hell, and like yeah. I thought that I think that show, your voice is crazy on that show. Holy shit! But uh, oh, thank you. That show's amazing. Like, just it made me actually. I don't like country music at all, but I definitely started listening to both of them afterwards because of that. Yeah, me too. I wasn't like up on that music myself, but you know, like like I was saying earlier about when we do a record or something, I definitely. God knows how many times I listen to those songs, but there's some incredible songs in there. And, and, and he's, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. And there are songs I would love to hear like punk versions of, you know, like some of George's songs, like you could, uh, the race is on or the door. I mean, cause it's got, they've definitely got like really dark, big emotions in them that would be fun to recontextualize in a you know punk aesthetic i think you guys found your next project <laughs> <laughs> like that would be amazing <laughs> like this definitely do this yeah because you're right it, it is but it's real music like i think that's what really came across and like this is reality music for these yeah even when other songwriters were writing the songs for them too like isn't that Should... spooky? Like that guy, George Ritchie, writing all those songs for Tammy and George, marrying Tammy, shooting her up with drugs, writing songs about their lives, and then they sing them. And everybody's like, oh, this is their lives. And it, it's, it's almost like a chicken and the egg thing. It's like, are the songs... That's what I that's what I was so fascinated by. It's like, are they living the songs or are the songs living them? Or 
like if somebody wrote them some happy songs, would they be happy? You know? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it's just very spooky. It, it's it's very spooky, and like you kind of get the vibe that George was one of those guys that even though did scale up huge, also dealing with trauma and abuse, but like probably would have been more comfortable just playing in that. I don't know juke joint might not be the, the country bar type thing. Oh like, yeah. Yeah, he didn't like the big. He didn't. He didn't really like the spotlight. It didn't seem like to me. Yeah, and it's like this Faustian deal that you have to make, and that they both make. Where you know they 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 made this amazing music. They had this incredible run, but like, it, it seemed to eat them up alive. In a lot yeah, of it really did. It really did. But that's that's the story of this. You know, how many people has that happened to? I thought it was interesting. The one thing was uh, the KLF, the portrayal of the KLF stuff, with mm-hmm. that, where that's like meant to, it, it's shown kind of like that's a dark period. And I, obviously her, her daughters were inv- heavily involved in the movie, I believe, or the series, right? I, I believe. Mm-hmm. So that must have been the way it was. But I always felt that was portrayed like that was like one of the kind of like up points for her. Well, it was the biggest hit she ever had, or was the biggest, you know, the highest selling song she ever participated in i guess but um but yeah at that time i think she was pretty deep into the drugs and stuff you know? yeah 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 and, and i guess that's the other thing with punk too like it's sadly there's so many names of people that you could just run through that are, that didn't make it through that it's glamorized in the way it also is in country music the the drug abuse in a certain level like johnny thunders right like the guitar yeah. hero to end all guitar heroes yeah, it brings to mind this game I used to play with my siblings when I was a kid. We, You'd have to run down the hallway. So there were four of us. And one of us, usually my little brother, because it was the funnest to do it to him. Um, and then the other three of us would be in random rooms with pillows. <laughs> and you had to run down the hallway. And we tried to, like, whack you in the face with a pillow uh, when you passed us. And then I, the object for you was to try and not get hit. But usually you did, and you wound up on your ass. And that's kind of like what a, a career in the music business is. Yeah. like Trying to make it down the hallway without getting whacked in the face with a pillow. Well, yeah, because you look at the biggest bands, and, you know, it doesn't necessarily seem happy in, in a no. lot of cases. Unless you're Jason Arduzzi and you're just smiling all the time, it's so obnoxious. That's he's wearing he's wearing the mask. That's what he said. You got to be that positivity. That I'm plays. playing my role. Yeah, he's playing yeah. his role. <laughs> he's going to be it. Well, I-, I could keep you both all day and punish you both all day, but um, I-, I imagine you have a lot to do. But before I let you go, uh, Jason, who's coming up? What's the next shows coming up? You're saying they have an opener. Yeah, so uh, for the Murmur Tour, we have uh, two San Francisco shows, February 1 and February 2, um, as part of Sketchfest. Are you familiar with Sketchfest? Only because I've seen those insane flyers with everybody in comedy playing. Yeah, yeah, huge comedy thing. But they do music, too, and um, they asked us to do Murmur on February 1 and Reckoning on February 2. So there'll be two separate shows. Wow. And then um, and then we've got Minneapolis, February 4th, Athens, February 8th, Chapel Hill, February 9th, D.C., February 10th, Ardmore, Pennsylvania, February 12th, Cambridge, Massachusetts, February 13th, and ending in Brooklyn, February 14th, Valentine's Day. For the East Coast shows, uh, Mr. Dave Hill, comedian uh-huh. and musician extraordinaire, will be the opening act. And uh, we're, we're excited. A uh, new book too. He's got a brand new book as well. Like very funny guy about hockey. Yeah, uh, yeah. We, uh, I mean, Mike and I have been doing these shows, these these album oriented shows for ten years, but this is the first time that we've gone on the road with something. Basically, because it just sort of it struck a chord. You know, the the show at Metro was packed, and there was just kind of this beautiful energy, and we started getting offers from other venues. So we just we found two weeks where we were all available and. Um, It'll be a first, and we're, we're excited about it. Also, like it's funny you brought up comedy, and that was something I wanted to talk to you about because, like, 
John Glazer, because I know you were on Delocated at uh, oh, yeah. Point Michael. Um, you know, eating it, that kind of comedy scene out of, um, out of uh, I think it was it, New Boston eating it, that thing that John Glazer, H. John Benjamin, um, David Cross, Tom Sharpling told me about it when he was on the podcast, but it's, it feels like very much the same sort of energy that comes about in comedy. That's all these people that were inspired in some small way by punk or, or punk adjacent. Certainly David Cross was a punk. I, I've known John since I was a teenager. I remember when he was in Chicago doing a, a non-union theater um, and seeing him in plays at, you know, little storefronts and stuff. I think maybe even before he got into improv, but uh, yeah, he's, he's funny. He's a real funny guy, John. I don't really know any of the other, I, I haven't really met David Cross, but I think he's real funny. And H. John Benjamin is an amazing jazz p- piano player. Oh, is he? Oh. He does. He might be bit. my favorite. Yeah. He's when he what he did on Doctor Cats. I think that's my favorite. Yeah, character. Yeah, that's good. Oh, have you yeah. ever heard? Did you ever hear the stuff he did on the Best Show, um, John Worcester's radio show? No. He did a bunch of calls, including one called "Blood, Sweat, No Tears," about the lead about being the trombonist and. Blood, Sweat, and Tears son. I might be brutalizing the whole thing. The setup. <laughs> who's written a book called Blood, Sweat, No Tears uh, about how brutal David Clayton Thomas was to be in a band with. And it is one of the funniest radio calls ever. They got a cease and desist order. And then John Worcester gets involved as a lawyer. And it's just unbelievably incredible. <laughs> wow. I got to like, look that up. True genius level stuff. But yeah, like it's. Uh, you know, David Cross, too, like uh, another guy who definitely came out of punk rock and found a way to do it his way. And, you know, I'm a huge Mr. Show fan, obviously. And you've done stuff with the other half of Mr. Show. Great. Oh, movie. Bob. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was fun. That movie. Let's go to prison. Yeah, that was a good one. Did you know him from yeah, Chicago? I, I, I think Bob's uh, really he's a really sweet guy. Um, I haven't seen him in a while, but I'm really happy for all his success. Boy, he's really blown up. Yeah, very, uh, once again, uh, happy to see it happen because he seems like a really nice guy. And yeah, this has been sweet. This has been awesome. Both you guys, I want to wish you the best of luck on this tour. And you. you ever need another opener, let me know. I, 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 can, do a, <laughs> <laughs> I can do a mean, whatever growly guy you want. No blood, <laughs> sweat, tears. Yeah. Exactly. No blood. No razors. Yeah. No STIs. <laughs> Thank you, Jason and Michael, for coming on the show. And you heard right there, they will both be back at some point in the future for a part three and a part two. Or maybe they'll be back together. Or who knows? Who knows what configuration? Uh, that was a lot of fun and go and check them out performing those, uh, murmur shows. If you are in those areas when they are being performed and hopefully they'll add more dates as well and go early. See Dave Hill perform. Very funny guy. Very great musician. What a night. What a night. Well, what a show coming up on the next episode of turned out of punk. We're going to keep these duos going, but this time with a brother duo. From the band Scream, from the band Wool, from countless other projects, but there's a brand new fantastic Scream record on Discord that they have come back together to do. Pete and Franz Stahl are going to be on the show. And if you, oh my gosh, you are in for a good one with this episode. We go all over the place. Lots of wild stories. Oh, I'm excited for you to hear it. And that's it for me. Remember, as always, Black Lives Matter. The lives and issues faced by indigenous peoples all over the world matter. We need to protect trans kids and help trans people protect themselves and their rights. And stop hate and violence towards people of different races or different faiths. And make sure that people have the rights to choose what they want to do with their reproductive systems. Because these are not political issues. These are just basic human rights issues. People deserve to be able to live free from hate and violence and discrimination And so if there's organizations that are affecting positive change in the world around you, I'm sure they could use your support, lend your time, lend your money, whatever, whatever you can do. 
And speaking about getting involved, get involved in the punk scene. Do a band, start a podcast, start a fanzine. Maybe not a podcast. There's lots of stuff that can be done. And the culture gets better when you participate in it. Um, participation. That something that definitely needs a lot of participation is organ donor programs. Donate your organs. Sign those organ donor cards because it performs miracles. I've seen it happen. I've seen it. And I also have seen meditation really help positively in my life. And maybe it'll help positively in yours. So try meditating. And that's it. I'll see you on the next episode. Thanks for listening. Bye.